My topic here is the Danish National Archives, uh, and it's tips and tricks for Danish West Indies genealogy research. Um, uh, I'm feeling a little bit like an imposter, but you know, basically my experiences with doing, uh, um, I started with this website uh, with doing the crowdsources, uh, crowdsourcing, doing the indexing. Um, and I think that that's uh, kind of a really good way to learn certain parts of the record. Um, and so when Sophia asked uh, um, earlier on, would I be willing to do something on this line? I thought, okay, maybe that would be okay. I had uh, looked at doing, uh, there's uh, with the West Indies, records at the Danish National Archives, they have it grouped into 26 different groups. And I kind of thought I, uh, for this year, I would take one of those groups every two weeks and kind of delve into it a little bit more. So um, we kind of sped things up or whatever for that. But um, this is a, a little bit of kind of what I've found. Um, so here we go. So uh, what we're talking about, the Danish National Archives or Riggs Archivet, um, and I don't pronounce Danish, so um, this is my Danish West Indian pronunciation of it. Um, uh, the uh, uh, national, Danish National Archives are in uh, Copenhagen, uh, and what we're looking at is a subset of the records that they have there that pertain to the Danish West Indies. And um, the Danes' uh, first permanent settlement, St. Thomas, was in 1672, uh, sold to the U.S. in 1917. And at that time, the islands were renamed U.S. Virgin Islands. And uh, a little bit before then, in the late 1890s and 1900 uh, uh, range, the um, archives, uh, they started shipping the archives back to Denmark. Um, and that's part of what is in this group. And then sometime uh, shortly after uh, um, the, the transfer in 1917, I think it was sometime about 1920 or whatever, they divvied up uh, the remaining archives that were in St. Thomas and, and St. Croix. Um, and basically um, some went to Denmark, some went to the U.S. National Archives, and they figure it's about a 40% of the U.S. National Archives and 60% at the Danish National Archives. Um, and so the Danish National Archives really represents the largest collection of historical documents for the Danish West Indies. And just a great resource. It's over 5 million records. And then as part of the 1917 uh, 100th anniversary for 2017 um, of transfer day, they ended up uh, um, uh, basically uh, digitizing um, pretty much all of what they had for the Danish West Indies records that were able to be digitized. Now there's some with uh, termite damage and that type of thing. Um, but, but basically this is a huge collection, high resolution digital um, images, uh, you can, it's able to download, it's free access. This is really uh, just a great uh, collection. And anybody who is serious about doing any research uh, for the period 1917 and before in the U.S. Virgin Islands, um, former Danish West Indies, uh, needs to know about this record. Um, and this is just really kind of a workhorse of the records. Um, so let's see here. Now I need to figure out, oh, there we go. Um, so what's the catch? And really the catch is it's 5 million records. How do I find my ancestors? And uh, when I started kind of um, figuring out what I was gonna do for this talk, um, you know, uh, this is kind of what I felt like, um, the scream. <laughs> um, you know, basically this is, a, this is a huge amount of records and the difficulties with it is that uh, I, I'm not sure if I understand the organization of the records. It's really organized as to what, um, uh, uh, what part of the government kind of made the records and it, it's difficult to understand the organization of these records. Um, the index, 
there, there is an index for this, but it uh, it's only covers a small fraction. I think I read somewhere about 130,000 images out of 5 million. Um, the, the download can be difficult from the index search. Um, and that's something that we'll go through. Uh, and then many of the records are in Danish. And the disclaimer here is I don't read Danish, uh, not very well. Um, and then uh, to add to it, the Gothic script, that makes it really difficult. So uh, basically, um, I kind of, uh, uh, part of what I wasn't sure of kind of what my, um, uh, what my uh, process was. And that was part of preparing for this talk is kind of figuring out what I do because I have had some success kind of doing the family stories and such. And a lot of those things are based on what I've seen from the, uh, from the Danish National Archives. So kind of what I, I, th I think uh, before you start, uh, first thing is know your people, uh, know your archives and know a little Danish. And uh, I kind of like this uh, saying uh, from Louis Pasteur, chance favors only the uh, mind which is prepared. So know your people. Um, uh, who are you looking for? What was their name? And with name, I would also go nickname um, because uh, there's a, that's a common thing with uh, Islanders at the nickname. And some of those nicknames do show up in the archives. Um, the uh, oral history, your family records, baptism records, census records from um, the U.S. Uh, times, if you're kind of uh, tracing your family back through. Um, so it's the who, the what, um, the events, the birth, marriage, and death. And the important thing for this is knowing what religion. If you, if you can know the religion of your ancestor, that really helps you to be able to kind of figure out which um, which uh, uh, records that you're looking at, um, where, uh, so did they, what island did they live on? Were they in town or country? Um, if they were in Charlotte Amalia, which quarter were they in? Um, you know, uh, so uh, were they in Savan? Were they uh, upstreet? So these type of uh, information will help to kind of guide you as far as where you're gonna be looking in the archives. And then when? Uh, the dates, um, that's real important as far as, uh, do you know when they were born, died, married, or you have some general idea, you know where to be searching. And then um, there's a couple different approaches. You can kind of just uh, say, okay, I'm gonna go in and put in the search engine, search index. Uh, you know, I wanna know everything about this person, or you can form some research questions. If you have some questions in mind that can help to suggest uh, where you should go to take a look at things. So um, know your people. Uh, this is my starting point for the Danish National Archives. My two Danish grandparents, um, my grandfather, uh, Giorgio Moreno, um, and uh, my grandmother, Verna Dinsey. And basically that's kind of where I start from. And um, I found both of them in the, in the uh, Danish National Archives. And in fact, when I started, that was really kind of who I looked for first. And I started with the 1911 census. Um, I'll kind of throw in a little bit about uh, crowdsourcing is that that's how I started first with these records. And um, the indexing is kind of a little bit of drudgery, but one of the benefits is if you're indexing, um, you can actually, um, kind of put little extra things in there. That's allowable, in fact, it's encouraged. And so, for example, for uh, the 1911 census record uh, for my grandmother, uh, her name is Verna Dinsey. Well, the, um, uh, uh, the record was created by uh, somebody who was basically kind of drafted in, you're gonna do this street or whatever um, for enumerating. And he put it as uh, Vana. V-A-U-N-A, -A. it's just the pronunciation. So, uh, and her brother was Vaughn, Vern, V-A-U-N. And so both of that, uh, so if you, um, if you were just looking for her name, Verna Dinsey, you wouldn't find it in an index. But actually the way I set it up as I, I did that, um, I, I indexed that record and I put in the notes 
this should be Verna. This is just the, uh, you know, the regular pronunciation for, of the island pronunciation. So just a kind of a little um, uh, plug there as far as uh, crowdsourcing, if you are interested, um, that there are some benefits to, be, uh, to doing uh, indexing for your family's records. Uh, so it's really from these two that have worked backwards. And basically, um, uh, know your people. Uh, these are my um, uh, surnames. Um, and then basically, I'm going to just kind of concentrate on uh, some of my uh, grandparents' maternal lines and some of the documents that I found in the uh, uh, Danish National Archives that have uh, been helpful as far as my search on things. Um, and I think a lot of the way that I've kind of learned is just kind of seeing what others have done and saying, oh, can, can I find those records and, and what would it have for me? So hopefully this will be helpful. Um, my, um, uh, I have kind of a collection of uh, about six stories or so that I have on uh, uh, Valerie Sims' blog. So it's at uh, ValerieSims.com slash blog. But I also have kind of a uh, landing page that she has uh, set up for me as far as kind of the family story. So thank you very much, Val. Uh, uh, so uh, basically, I looked uh, back at my family stories and most of them have, uh, are based on records that, that come from the Danish National Archives from the Riggs Archive. So it really is, um, this is a great resource. Um, so then that uh, comes to know your archives. Um, so kind of the general information, we talked about how these records uh, uh, got back to Denmark. Um, and they're in the group that they call the West Indian records. Um, you have to kind of, uh, by, uh, I think partly things like this workshop and just looking around, figuring out what records are available. Um, and then what records are located elsewhere. Um, there's a lot of records that are located at the US uh, National Archives. And I really don't know much about that. Um, I see that uh, David Lynch is here and he's, uh, he'd be my expert to, to go to, at least uh, from what I uh, have recalled from all the work that you've done with that. Um, so you'd have to kind of know what's located elsewhere. Um, an example would be the passenger lists. I've used those uh, quite a bit. And um, the passenger lists, I think up to about 1899 are located in the Danish National Ar Archives. But uh, after that point, they're in the US National Archives. So you really have to kind of have some, some knowledge about uh, these things uh, kind of before you go in and, and do a really um, uh, kind of search by brute force. Um, so then uh, knowing the archives is how are these records organized? And the basic organization is that there's general groups, 26 groups, and their uh, accounts, census, maps. Um, it's just a whole host of things. And it's kind of uh, organized on the web page alphabetically. But some of the things um, they may kind of organize, like, I can't remember, it might say something like the probate records or whatever. So it's, it's a little bit funky as far as kind of the organization. Um, and so you just have to kind of know that and, and be comfortable kind of uh, jumping around and things. And there are records that you think, uh, well, this is a census, but it might be in a different record group. Um, so really when I look at the, uh, that organization, I drill down to, uh, I have kind of this, uh, uh, the, uh, um, the accounts is kind of that first big general group. Um, and I drill down to what the contents are. And, um, you know, in this case, accounts of Christiansted Harbor and pilot service. But the contents, uh, uh, I would look at as an actual book. And sometimes it's physically a book or maybe a, um, a couple books or a file group. Um, and so I kind of look at this as this is a big library, and these are the books that are on the um, on the shelves. And this would be kind of the uh, kind of a source. And then the image are those uh, single digital images, and they have a unique uh, URL that you can uh, 
uh, that uh, whenever I download something, I make sure I download the link. So if I want to kind of know how did I, where did I get that from? Um, and then uh, uh, knowing the archives, a couple questions that I like to ask, um, you know, who created this record? You know, is it, uh, you know, if it's a census record, oftentimes it's going to be um, by the townspeople that were kind of uh, drafted into, uh, into, into doing this, going up and down their street to record uh, the, the, um, the different households. Um, also looking at why it was uh, created, you know, um, is the record accurate? And, you know, that, and there can be misspellings and that sort of thing. And that really kind of, uh, if it's misspelled in the index, uh, it's hard to get at things. Um, and then I, I like to ask, how can I confirm and expand on um, the information in the record? It's kind of a starting point for me as far as making me uh, think of other questions. So the third part of being prepared, knowing a little Danish. And so I recognize some written words. Um, there's some genealogy words that you keep coming across. Um, and again, my pronunciation, I don't know, fot, uh, born, you know, do, died, uh, um, you know, boy, girl, are, you know, the year. Um, and then the Danes love their uh, compound words. So we get things like Dronigan's gata. Um, I was just looking at a regular record uh, this morning, uh, General told um, and you know, and, and basically it has to do with customs. Uh, told, toll, um, so that's kind of a cognate in, in the way I think. Um, uh, you know, hotel. So there's some cognates um, words that you can kind of think. Okay, here's a, an English uh, equivalent. Um, you know, this word, um, I don't know how to say it, but folk Italian or whatever, folk tallying, you know, counting of the people uh, is a census. Um, I use a bit of uh, uh, Google, you know, if you can spell the Danish exactly, uh, Danish to English, um, it does a fairly reasonable job. Um, and then the um, real important thing for these archives is to learn Danglish. And I thought I made that term up a few years ago. Um, I kind of use that for the uh, English words that just kind of pop out at you when you're looking at these Danish records. Um, but I just looked it up like a, a couple days ago. And actually that word has been around since uh, 1990, so I didn't make it up. Um, but uh, actually uh, in the Danish West Indies, they were doing Danglish from you know 150 years plus you know, uh, much longer. Um, so here's a little Danglish. Um, this is a record that I found um, from the, uh, uh, the customs, uh, custom house records. And just, uh, you know, just all in Danish, there's some Gothic script, but really my eye kind of came onto here. And this is a record from, um, this has about 677 images in this file. And there's no way I'm looking through that amount of, uh, of uh, images. What I ended up doing was I um, well, just kind of, uh, it's kind of random, um, but I randomly found this, um, this record. And uh, I saw this, I probably can't see it, it's, uh, but there's G Beretta. That's all I saw. Um, I'm going to enlarge it for you, but this is really um, that little piece there, and um, that's hard to read. I don't know what it says, but this is the Danglish, uh, fourth post, number 1883, Australia, G. Beretta, 100, $1,971.75, $29.15. So I've got this and I'm thinking, well, what do I do with this? I'm gonna download it, of course, but I don't understand this. Do I get somebody to help me with the Danish? Um, is it important? You know, it's in the custom house records. Is this really important for my research? Um, and I kind of said, yeah, um, it's $971.75. Well, you know, that's a lot of money. Um, this is 1893. Um, 
this number here, 29.15, is 3% of this uh, amount. That's probably a toll. Um, so I decided to keep looking in the record and um, this is actually the, uh, the address in the archives and you'll notice the number 19. So about uh, 16 records later, I found the answer in English in my great grandmother's handwriting. This is uh, the handwriting of Victorine Beretta, um, the mother to uh, my, uh, the uh, grandfather that I showed you. And so uh, says the undersigned reports to custom house of this island, the following appertaining to the uh, cargo of the German SS Australia from Grimsby. Um, so this is the Hamburg American line ship Australia uh, from Grimsby, England. And uh, it's uh, small, 50 small cases containing 1000 revolver cartridges, 12 millimeter. And it's got the uh, pounds They've translated the pounds back here. And so notice these uh, little clues that we had from the Danglish. Number 1883, Australia, G. Beretta. The, um, the uh, uh, cost and the, uh, the toll. That's all here in a record that's in English that I can read this. Um, so we got a better story here, right? Um, if we look here, Actually, let me, this um, PP um, G. Beretta, that's uh, pro, um, I forget the Latin, but basically this wasn't uh, uh, my great grandfather uh, doing this record. It was my great grandmother, Mrs. G. Beretta. And this is her picture from about that time. Um, so this even makes the story even better to me because here, this, uh, she's a woman. She's supposed to be at home with her three kids. Um, she actually had uh, her mother taking care of them, I would bet. Um, but she's taking care of business um, down at the customs house. Um, the other thing that you have to kind of look at is kind of the, the context of things. So this is where Know Your People comes in. Um, the date is 27th October, 1893. Well. She had a child on the 3rd of December, uh, 1893, um, my uh, great aunt, Julia. Um, so here she is, she's probably about, uh, she's in her third trimester, she's 35 weeks along and she's taking care of business. So the other part of this, uh, the other questions this brings is, well, where is um, her husband, Giorgio? Um, and I suspect he may have been um, you know, off island, and she was taking care of business. Um, and he may have been, you know, they, uh, they had uh, a ship at that time, um, and they did some uh, trading uh, inter-island. And so I just need to look at the, um, at the travel records to be able to see if I can uh, round the story out some more. So that's kind of uh, an example. Um, and that starts with the Danglish, right? Um, so here is the custom house that we're talking about. And here's kind of where I, I pulled some of my other stuff. So this is from, um, from my archives. Uh, this is a G. Beretta postcard from 1912. It was published. Um, and that's the custom house and the post office. Um, by the way, if anybody has um, any G. Peretta postcards, I'd be interested in hearing from you because I wanna kind of get uh, kind of a, uh, an, uh, a nice collection together. I've probably got about 16 images uh, from these so far. Um, okay. So um, we're gonna go to the sites. Um, there's really uh, three, um, main websites that I look at, main web addresses. And uh, that's the Danish West Indies history. And this is kind of um, the, uh, the website that uh, Sophia kind of put on there. This is really the site for the index. The index takes you to the crowdsourcing um, site. And so that's this. Uh, you won't do much directly with that unless you're doing some crowdsourcing. 
And then this is kind of uh, the, the Danish National Archives, the English. You don't want the, uh, the Danish part of it. Uh, um, you want the English and that's that EN here. So um, this is the landing page for the Virgin Islands History.org. This is the search. And um, there's a little how to get started that basically uh, kind of explains some of the tricks that you can do with searching. This gets started as a different thing, um, which kind of uh, gives a little bit of an idea how to navigate some of the resources. I think it's a, it's a good uh, place to start. They have find a person, find a place, uh, sources about colonial power, sources about slavery. Um, I've really used the find a person to get started, the sources about slavery. Um, and then this is a, uh, I'm going to just, uh, this is a little video that I kind of have uh, that shows how I navigate through. Um, so we'll see if it works. Just like about, no, what did I do wrong? See, and here's my, um, how do I go back? <laughs> Let's see. Okay, let's see. Here we will learn a little bit about navigating these websites. The first we start off is the search site, virginalishistory.org, uh, English. And I'm just going to type in a search term here, my surname. Y'all can hear, right? And I'm going to hit enter. You can hear fine. That takes me to the search results page. It shows that there's 79 transcribed records. We'll just scroll down. We'll take the first one, Census of 1911, Danish West Indies. That takes us to the crowdsourcing website. And here we go, the collection, Danish West Indies. The record series, Census of 11. And then the content, which is the book, St. Thomas, Charlotte Amalia, Congdon's Quarter. And here's the record that we want. Remember here's image 286. To get it a download for this, we need to go into the Danish National Archives website proper. This is the English archives. And we're gonna do a lot of our work here at the West Indies. And so I'm just gonna click on that. And oftentimes I just keep this uh, website up as my usual uh, landing place. So here we go, the West Indies, and there's 26 different subject areas, but we're gonna to go to Census West Indies. And we'll scroll down. Here's the West Indian Census of 1911. St. Thomas, Charlotte, Amalia, Congdon's Quarter. And this is the book for that, if you will. And we're going to go to image number 286. Here we go. And then we want to download it. We go up to the top here, this top menu, save image. We click on that. And then we double click and then there's save image as, and we could put a different name in. We could uh, put it to a different folder, but I'm just gonna save it to my desktop. And I'm gonna hit return and it's downloaded. And that's how you navigate through to getting a high quality image that you can download.
Okay. So that's kind of the process. There's a little bit to it. And if anybody has a, um, a way to do it uh, uh, that's easier, please let me know. But um, uh, I don't know if uh, we could, if we, uh, you know, the, basically that, uh, that's kind of the process that I do for go going through and finding these things. Um, and then this is the actual image. Um, and so this is 1911 census, uh, kind of my, my starting place for these records. And this is stuff that you could get on microfilm before. But as you notice, it really is, uh, you know, this is the color copy. It really is a lot better quality. Um, and the interesting thing is that uh, there's two signatures down here. My um, uh, grandfather, uh, George Beretta, is how he was known, um, was a in, uh, indexer for the census. And I have a story about that. And my uh, great grandfather, actually, uh, uh, Archibald Dinsey, was also a um, uh, indexer for the uh, a, a, uh, uh, for the census. So. Um, so the search index um, uh, is is good when it has the name in there. Um, when it doesn't, it's it's difficult. And so the question is, why can't I find my ancestor in the index? And um, the probably the most common thing is that this specific record exists, but it's not indexed. Um, uh, there are other things. The name is, uh, could be spelled differently. And so it's the indexer's job to do it original verbatim, even if you know that, na that name is spelled wrong. And uh, a couple examples I've seen, Sprow. Um, I can't tell you how many different spellings I've seen of that name. Um, you know, uh, uh, Cattell. That's even more of a problem because uh, I've seen some records where it's K-E-T-E-L. And you know you're looking at a record from French Town or something and you've got, got that. And so that's where I've done some things as far as when, if I'm indexing a record like that, I'll put in the notes, uh, K-E-T-E-L is likely Cattell, you know, Q-U-E-T-E-L. Um, uh, another problem is that if you're looking for a, a you know, a travel record from 1920, you're not gonna find it here, wrong time frame. Um, and then uh, what we talk about records are elsewhere. And um, that's a difficult thing to know, kind of what records are where. And that's, so this is a, a little, this is just kind of the landing page for the crowdsourcing uh, site. And, and then this is where I've uh, spent a lot of my time uh, kind of looking at, at things. And basically there's um, a couple things I say about this page. You really wanna be living here, uh, kind of the, the West Indies. Um, the, do not uh, search the database DAISY. That has to be, uh, that's just for record types and it has to be in Danish. It really is not, uh, not a, a good place. This is really uh, down here, the West Indies. Um, they also have the parish registers, registers, and if you go in, you'll find the West Indian. But um, but you can uh, you can access these by the West Indies here. So, um, and then this is that uh, when you click on that West Indies, this is what you come up with. Um, so uh, I've kind of done uh, a lot of things where I can't find people in the index. I'll do what I consider maybe a directed search. Um, and there's different areas that I'll kind of look at things. And so I think I'm just gonna kind of present a few things that um, I found that I think are of interest. Um, maps, uh, the section for the maps is really kind of a, a treasure trove. Um, and this is one of the one of the maps. If you're doing any research with uh, Charlotte Amalia doing the uh, census records, this is really a useful map. Um, it, it's hard to see with this, but there's the numbers, the street names. Um, so it actually, you can figure out uh, the property uh, outline. 
uh, which is pretty nice. Um, we'll come back to this map specifically. Um, this is the, the, uh, the URL for this one specifically. Um, and I'm gonna go to census records. Um, these are the years for the census. Uh, and as I said before, that the 1911 is my kind of starting point. Um, one of the things I like about the census is that uh, almost everyone's included. Um, if somebody's off island, they're supposed to kind of say that uh, this person is off island, you know, uh, and you'll oftentimes see that um, uh, with a sailor or whatnot, that they may not have been um, there present, but uh, they would have been, um, uh, uh, they would have been enumerated that they were off island. Um, so census is good information as far as family structure, the age, religion, their occupation. And the organization of these census records, if you're just going to go through them without um, having an index or having an image number to go to, it's, um, it's by island, uh, the town, and the quarter. In the, in, um, in the case of Charlotte Amalia, the three quarters. Um, and then the individual records. So the, uh, for Charlotte Molly, I'll take that as an example. Uh, Congen's quarter would be one um, book. And in that book is the number of images. And those images are um, uh, organized by alphabetic order. Um, and you just have to kind of know too that, uh, you know, with uh, Danish, Commandant uh, Gata, we, we spell it with a C but in Danish is spelled with a K. So sometimes you'll find those records under the K. Um, and so it's a way to kind of be able to go into a, a, a record. And if you know, well, I, I know that they lived on Dronigan's Gata, um, you know, in, in you know, Kongen's Quarter, you know, that you're not searching through the whole record. You kind of go to where you think the Ds will be and you um, uh, search from there. And then uh, for other areas, it's uh, island, rural quarter, and estate. So um, the, uh, I, I make a couple uh, special things about the census of 1840, um, 1841 and 1846, and uh, specifically in regards to um, kind of the uh, slavery records. And so during uh, these times, um, uh, enslaved persons were often listed by the first name, uh, so no surname. So you have to have a way of distinguishing um, which Lydia is which. And in the case of my uh, great, great, great grandmother, Lydia, she was from Estate Mountain. Um, she was the only Lydia there for uh, however many years that I've uh, kind of searched through um, from 1835 to 1870. Um, oftentimes, if there were two people of the same uh, name um, in the estate village, um, the, you know, for example, Sally, I've seen things like Sally uh, um, listed in Long Sally. Um, and then for the 1841 and 1846 uh, census, you need to be aware there are free and unfree books. So you have your uh, Crown Princess Porter free um, book. And then your Crown Prince's quarter uh, unfree. Um, and so you need to kind of, this is again, know your people, um, were they free or unfree? Um, uh, I'm going to just talk a little bit about a search that I did in the 1846 census. Uh, and this is the uh, uh, Catherine uh, Fleming, Fleming family. Uh, her daughter, uh, Josephine Herzig, was. Um, my grandfather's uh, grandmother. So this would be my third great grandmother, uh, Catherine Fleming. And what we have here is, this is the old microfilm. Um, so you can see the quality and this is the newer. Uh, this is the new scanned version that they put up online um, in 2017 for the 100th anniversary. Um, much different quality. Uh, this is really, this is just a very uh, much easier to read. Um, so, and I'll just point out, this is my great-great-grandmother, Josephine Herzig. 
And I kind of looked at this, you know, thinking about this story from, uh, you know, the standpoint of a, you know, she's a 12 year old girl um, and she's at, um, this uh, address is 9A Crown Princess Gata in Crown Princess Quarter, right? This is the, uh, uh, the uh, Western extension of Main Street. And I'm thinking, you know, the story here is that she is the um, daughter of a uh, German uh, immigrant. Uh, he is a merchant. Her mother is a, uh, a seamstress. And so we've kind of got this recurring pattern in my family. That's part of the story with this. Um, but part of the story is I kind of wonder what was life like for her. Um, so part of what I did was to uh, pull from the, uh, the unfree book, um, the same record for 9A Crown Princess Quarter, Crown Prince of Gata. And uh, um, so there were six unfree, six enslaved persons at this address. And uh, just a kind of a side note as far as where they were from, four were from St. Thomas, one from Martinique. Here's uh, Jacques, he's from Africa. Um, he's 50 years old, so he's born in about 1796. Um, you know, the, um, the interesting thing is in these records, uh, you know, down the street in uh, um, Noragata, which was the eastern end of uh, Main Street, I found a record for a young lady, and her name was Marianne. Uh, she's listed in the Unfree Records, and she's uh, 28 years old. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's 28, so she was born, um, you know, uh, pro, um, in, in 1818, and she was from Africa. So, you know, the uh, slave uh, trade was outlawed as far as, I think it was 1803, 1804, and so you wonder if there was some... Um, some loopholes of getting around that if she came through another island or, but it's interesting to see how many of these records have uh, folks who are listed as born in Africa and not, um, and well beyond the, uh, the uh, time from when the slave trade was outlawed. Um, the other thing that's, uh, that you can look at with these is that um, in the case of this Marianne, and I don't have the record up here, but um, uh, she was baptized as Catholic and they had the date um, as 1832. Um, so uh, when she was 14 years old. So it makes you wonder when she came from Africa. She obviously came as a youth um, before she was 14. Um, so it's, uh, it, it can get a little bit uh, confusing, but the, at least there's, there's some clues there. Um, so uh, I'm gonna take this story a little bit further with this um, uh, Crown Princess Gata 9A. Here's that map that I showed you from before, uh, zoomed in. And here is Crown Princess Gata, here's 9A. Um, it's a large building, right? Um, it's gotta be, it's got 80 people in it. And if you look, there's this Brond, B-R-O-N-D, um, I don't know how to say it, but that's well in Danish, and I think it's two of them. So you can imagine that when she needed to go get water, you know, when they sent uh, young Josephine, she'd go to the well. Here's the market. It's uh, Casimir Square. We know it as Market Square now. And they even have the, um, the mahogany trees <laughs> drawn in. <laughs> um, you know, so you get a little bit better sense for things. So it's, uh, these are still records that are within the archives and you're just kind of rounding out the story. And then um, another way that I like to round out the story is to look at the matricale. Um, and that is basically kind of the tax record for the property. Now they didn't own this property. And so why would you bother looking at a property that they didn't own? Well, um, here's Crown Princess got a 9A and um, and I've got uh, something on top of this, but I think it's a, uh, this is the, um, it's got a Pierce Square Allen. Allen is a Danish measure of uh, distance. And so, um, and Allen is basically about two uh, English feet, so two feet. 
Um, and so a square Allen is gonna be uh, uh, four square feet. And so this is 1765 square Allen. It's 7,060 7, square feet. So that works out to about an average of 88 square feet per person. Um, this was cramped quarters. Uh, you know, this is, uh, and this is how she grew up. And this is two years before the emancipation. So you've got a, this building that has a mix of uh, people, probably a lot of uh, rooms that are rented out. Um, here's the owners, uh, Jean Barard's born, that's his children. Og and um, B. Grizzard. So this uh, building is being rented out. Um, lots of people living there. And, and so she's this 12-year-old girl and, you know, they're, they're enslaved who are, uh, they're in the same building. That's part of her little, um, uh, 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 well, her, basically her address. Uh, that, that's who's uh, living there. So um, this is kind of the, uh, the spot where these matricle uh, records for St. Thomas, St. John. And if, when you find that in the, uh, the archives, the St. Croix ones are just adjacent to it. But a lot of information that you can get from it, even though it's just a tax record. Um, I'm just gonna talk, a, I'm just gonna kind of pick a couple different areas that uh, Kind of pertain to me and it's just a sampling of really what's in the archives where um, that's all we're looking to do today is a sampling so um, baptism records um, th this is i think under the section church and mission um, so this is the lutheran baptisms from 1894 and by the way there's about two or three different uh, copies of this um, they would make copies and send back to Denmark, or the, um, there would be the baptismal record that would sit at the church. Um, but then every three months, they would make a list of uh, uh, who they baptized, who died, and they would send it to the government. Because there wasn't the civil registration like we had in, you know, like we have in the U.S. It was um, the church. Um, registered, um, you know, who was born, uh, basically marriages, the deaths. So this one, um, it's hard to see, but uh, I pulled this, this is Edna Augusta Adams, and she's actually um, a cousin to my uh, grandmother. So I showed you a picture of my grandmother. Um, and so this is her cousin, her older cousin, um, uh, by about 13 years. And so this record is her baptism in 1894. Her father's Jacob uh, Henry Adams. Uh, he is a Tomrer, um, I think that means carpenter. Petrina Evangeline Adams is her mother. Uh, and so we've got all this, this Danish here, but we can read this, right? This is the Faderins, the father, mother, the name, Navin. Um, and then over here, and let me do this here. Um, over here, it lists the, the sponsors. And I always say, look at the sponsors and see if you can figure out who they are. Um, and A. Dinsey is my Archibald Dinsey, my great grandfather. So um, he was one of uh, uh, her sponsors. Basically, that's his niece. And we find them together, living together in the 1911 census. And she's basically kind of running the household. Um, uh, and she also was present at the baptism as a sponsor for his kids uh, in the later years. So um, just shows how connected these families were. Um, the, so the kind of the, the thing, I always kind of like to pull what this, what's the story here. And this is Edna Augusta Adams. Uh, we called her auntie. Um, and this is her at her 100th birthday celebration at the same church. So the baptism record is kind of a picture of what was uh, happening in 1894. This is 1994. Um, and this is uh, some photographs that my mom did. 
uh, for uh, the uh, the uh, church ceremony for uh, celebrating her 100th birthday. She looked 105 and she really got uh, uh, gave me a lot of good information that my grandmother couldn't give me because she was older. Um, and she actually lived uh, with my great grandfather. So. Um, so I'm coming back to here. I'm going to just talk a couple things about some slavery records very difficult area um, to find the records and to to make sure that you're who you're looking at is who you who you want to be tracing um, it's difficult but not impossible um, and i come back to this landing page because they have sources about slavery and there's a whole host of different things. And I think that uh, that bears some further looking at um, it, because they have some good stepping off points as far as uh, uh, records in the archives. I'm just gonna show a couple things for um, what I've uh, found with my search. And this is, um, so this is a register uh, from 1835 um, of the, uh, is basically a census for uh, estate mint and mountain uh, in Prince's, Prince's Quarter uh, in Western St. Croix. The, and it uh, talks about the owner is the uh, governor, uh, F. Um, Osholm, uh, Frederick Osholm. Um, and I, uh, I detail this record out. Uh, I have kind of a family story about uh, I kind of weave catch and keep into, um, you know, the uh, kind of the uh, the Danish name for uh, that not the Danish the native name for catch and keep the plant was white police, and so I have a story that talks about kind of uh, uh, this and kind of uh, runs back to the um, to the register from 1835, uh, and this is kind of listed under the slave list. Um, on this plantation, this particular plantation, um, again, this is my uh, great great grandmother, Lydia of Mountain, was at this plantation. And there are different kind of uh, headings here, but one of the headings, if ever as criminals punished by judgment or the governor general resolution, and how and when punished. And there were um, 10 adults out of 52 on this plantation that had been punished within the last year. And so my thinking is there was something going on here. And I have this uh, kind of, this is part of the story, the, my latest story that I put on uh, Valson's blog. But, um, you know, it's a, this is a rich um, yeah, uh, record. It's just a lot of important information. Um, here's the section, the second page with my, um, Ancestor Liddy, they spell it L-Y-D-Y. -Y. Uh, she's five years old. And this little tick here means she's part of the grass gang. So she was old enough to be considered one of the workers. Um, this is her younger sister, Hester, or Esther, and, and Ellen. And the thing about these records, they don't list as family groups. So you kind of have to find that by looking at uh, other census records and such. Um, I think they basically just copied it from a plantation record book. And I uh, have yet to see any kind of uh, things like that, but that would be kind of a good, a good find as far as being able to find kind of the original plantation record books. Um, here's another thing that I just found recently. And again, it's kind of uh, weird places that you find them. So this is a general told camera, whatever, but this, the, the English thing that they had was Chamber of Customs and Commerce. So that's the, um, the, the grouping. And the record is on the commission appointed to investigate the West Indian government's official conditions on the emancipation in 1848 and the trial of Governor General Peter von Schulten. So um, <clears throat> the basic gist of it is emancipation 1848 uh, Western St. Croix, um, the enslaved marched on Frederickstead and threatened to burn, destroy the town um, if their demands were, for emancipation were not met. 
uh, Peter von Scholten, the governor general, um, basically uh, shows up and proclaims that they are free, you know, gets the Emancipation Proclamation uh, printed out. He, uh, he becomes ill and goes back to Denmark within a couple of weeks. Um, and he stood trial. Well, they have a, a now this is a, um, basically 788 images in this folder and very interesting, but it has no index. It has no table of contents. So what I'm doing is that I just decided, okay, I'm gonna kind of do some random things. And I found the, uh, it's a transcript of kind of, I think it's from the trials at the military court in Frederickstead. And here's a, uh, some more Danglish. Um, uh, number 16, 17, 18, George and Abraham of um, Estate Mountain and Caesar of Estate St. George. These are the uh, plantations that I'm interested in. Um, it's in 26, 28, and 30. That's probably their respective ages. I don't know. Uh, yeah, actually it is, because here's the word R, A-A-R, year. Um, 4th and 5th July. So the emancipation was 3rd of July, 1848. The 4th and 5th of July, they were doing something that they got in trouble for. Um, and these are the records from the military court. And so I don't understand any of this, but I know that this is the people from uh, my ancestral plantation. So something that I may wanna take a look into uh, later. Um, here's some other things that, uh, some other areas that I've kind of found useful information, um, you know, uh, Borger Brev, that's the Burger Briefs, uh, uh, the, the, the customs that we already looked at, taxes, uh, Danish Plantation Company. There's just a whole host of other things. Um, wills and probate, burly records, natural disasters. We will be getting, I, I think, a good uh, talk uh, in regards to some things that way uh, next week. And then the um, uh, it's some history things. There's the St. John um, land list are up to 1733. It really gives a picture of what plantations um, were there, the owners, uh, right before uh, the um, slave uprising of uh, November of 1733. Um, there's various records on emancipation, uh, in addition to the kind of one that I just highlighted. Um, there's records about Fireburn. Um, I was looking at a, a record that uh, had a long, one of these long Danish words, but part of it said October, O-K-T-O-B-E-R, uh, and then it had the date 1878. I know that's what, what that record's about. Um, I'm just going to present just a couple other things here. This is another find that I kind of uh, noted recently. So uh, Josephine Herzig, uh, the 12 year old girl in the 1846 uh, census, I found her uh, burial record. And this was um, what it said, Utskrifter F. St. Thomas Graver Journal. I don't even know if that's Danish or not, or that might be just some kind of um, you know, pigeon Danish English type of thing, um, 1896 to 1904. So, I saw this record and I thought, this is something that I want to look at because I knew that Josephine died in 1900. There was a, um, from a different source from the newspapers, um, I found that she had uh, died in April of 1900. Um, so I saw this record and thought, this is great. It has 138 images. I'm not going to look at 138 images. So what I ended up doing was just kind of said, okay, She's 1900, is halfway between 1896 and 1904. I'm going to look at image 69, and she was there. <laughs> I mean, sometimes you get lucky. Um, so here she is, Josephine Herzig, um, uh, born in St. Thomas. And the rest of the record basically talks about how um, she died from influenza. And it even says that she was um, buried at, in uh, the Western Cemetery. 
and it, it actually gives the coordinates of her um, burial plot. So sometime when I go back to St. Thomas, I'm going to have to kind of measure it out and see where she's buried. I'm pretty sure it's an unmarked um, uh, grave. That seems to be kind of a recurring theme uh, for uh, a lot of our family members. Um, but just a, a, that's just a find that I kind of, something that I found just a couple weeks ago. Um, Here's another thing. Uh, uh, I found some things in the probate records, and uh, this um, the probate records are kind of uh, earmarked in that uh, that uh, Virgin Islands history page. If you look at people, search people, uh, you'll find these links for the probate records. Um, but again, here we have to use our Danglish, right? Um, hard to read, but here we've got John Banners. St. Thomas, um, we've got uh, born children, Louisa, Anna, Ellen, Og, Emily. Um, that's probably all I can read there. But I happen to know that uh, John Benners is, um, and also it's, this is a number 20 probate of 1868. John Benners is um, the, uh, he was the editor for the St. Thomas Dead Ending. So um, when you look at the uh, kind of the news reports of the um, happenings of 1867, the hurricane, the earthquake, tsunami, um, the uh, uh, cholera um, epidemic, um, he uh, is writing, uh, uh, basically information about that. So um, I know that uh, there's uh, maybe a couple people here, Peter and Betsy, that uh, might be interested in this. Um, so uh, kind of summarizing uh, Danish National Archives, or Exarchitect, just an incredible resource. Um, when you want to go looking at it, prepare, know your people, know your archives, know a little Danglish. Um, you search the index and uh, from there kind of learning how to access the archives and download that which you find in the index. And when you can't find something in the index and you think it should be there, start with your directed search. Um, and sometimes you just find a record that's interesting and you do some freeform searching. Um, I didn't know what I would find in that record. Uh, for kind of the trial of uh, Von Scholten, but I kind of found things on my ancestral plantation um, and the folks from, from there and their uh, involvement in uh, the um, uprising of 1848. Um, and then uh, the other thing is just combining information from other sources that helps to kind of make a, for a richer, uh, more true story. And then the other thing that I have down here is that the uh, share. Uh, whether it be in kind of oral history, um, passing it along uh, to other folks, to um, written stories, uh, books. So, and then the, the last thing I'm going to leave with is that uh, to deal with um, these records, we need to have a little bit of uh, perseverance. Um, and so uh, perseverance, the definition, steady persistence in adhering to a course of action, a belief or a purpose, steadfastness. I also uh, think of perseverance as an estate on St. Thomas and West End, um, also called Flamingo Pond. And uh, that is my grandfather um, uh, bought in about 1917, 1918. So.